I have wonderful people on this webinar. Um, I'm Sarah Cooperman. I'm the CEO of SCW Fitness, and, yeah, and I force these people to give up their Sunday afternoon. So I really appreciate all of you guys joining us. Um, we have Bill McBride, and Bill is a health club industry veteran with over 25 years of experience leading and managing all aspects of commercial health clubs, medical fitness centers, residential, community, multi-tenant, and corporate fitness sites. Um, he manages it all. Chris Stevenson manages nothing, okay. He's an international speaker who regularly presents at fitness and business events across the world and regularly sports an amazing mustache, which he has taken off for just this webinar. And then we have Emma Berry, who's never had a mustache, but she's a global fitness authority who advises the innovative edge of fitness, boutique studios, budget clubs, digital workouts, and fit tech startups. So what we're doing today is we're talking about kind of an uncomfortable situation, is what do we do when COVID-19 strikes our club, either the members or our staff, somebody um, either is exposed to COVID or gets it themselves, and then how, what's the protocol after we're already open and how do we deal with this? So, we're reopening clubs sometimes pretty early before the pandemic has subsided in our communities. And we've seen this right now with Arkansas, Texas, California. Um, and sometimes we're reopening clubs in areas where there's virtually no COVID. So there's if a friend of mine, she is in Tennessee at very low count. But the dilemma is what do we do when the inevitable happens? You're, someone's going to get exposed. It might be our members, it might be our staff, it might be someone, you know, is bound to bring the virus into our club. And we've got to figure out how we're going to handle this and how we're going to be prepared. And before you guys were let in from the waiting room, um, we were chatting and I, I just love these guys. They're really smart. They're they're much smarter than me, and, and I love the, the information and the experience they bring. And we were talking, and the first thing I think of is, okay, what are we gonna do when we like let people into Dallas Mania? We're going to take their temperatures. We're gonna require them to fill out the health history form. We're gonna do these, all, these things. Automatically, this is what I'm thinking of. And so then I asked Bill, Bill, what do you recommend? if something like this happened and you're opening up your facilities and are they taking temperatures and what? And Bill responds and Is that says, you? Yeah. Uh, well, to you, buddy. With, with Dallas Mania or a concert or a big public, public event, um, I probably would take temperatures as a, as a gating safeguard. Um, we're not doing it in our locations um, for several reasons. One, just so many people are carriers when they're asymptomatic. They don't have the, the disease um, or, or they don't have the symptoms, but they're carrying the disease and spreading it. So I'm gonna miss those with a temperature check. Um, I don't wanna embarrass members that have a temperature. So I've gotta do that in a, in a screened off area to where they have some privacy. I don't wanna create chaos if somebody says, oh, I can't go in. Why did that person go up and then leave? You know, they must have a fever. Oh my God, everybody around here has been exposed to a person with a fever, you know? So I just think there's a lot of um, potential um, logistics, chaos, intrusion. Um, a lot of people feel that uh, the world's gone too far with protection right now. And they're kind of pushing back on that going, you know, I feel like this is violating my personal freedoms. Um, I'm not in that camp. Um, I wear my mask gladly, um, but we are getting pushed back with people that don't want to wear a mask, those kind of things. So we're kind of, you know, very on the, you know, proactive side of, of everything, but we've stopped short of doing temperatures for, uh, for members coming in. And Chris, you, you um, were responding and in agreement, which is very yeah. interesting. No, Bill and I, we're always on the same page. We're like, I'm his, I'm his, I'm his best friend, his younger best friend. Brent Darden's his older best friend. Um, I'm his younger best friend. Uh, no, and it's funny. Uh, first of all, definitely you got to follow the state and local guidelines. So, you know, some states require masks, some don't. 
Um, I don't know where a lot of states sit with temperatures, but if they say it's mandatory, then you have to do it. Uh, given the choice, and from what I've seen, most clubs, I'm in line with Bill. Uh, I, I just think – I don't think there's enough benefit to doing it. The, the negatives outweigh the positives in that regard. Um, and like I said, I've seen, you know, like Bill said, the logistics. If you are going to do it, how do you do it in a private area? How do you have those awkward conversations? How do you have the person who just fights you and says, I naturally run at a little higher temperature, or I was sitting in my car and it was hot. So I, I agree. I don't think the, the, the value is necessary there that offsets the headaches that it will provide. Interesting. Emma? Nothing to add. <laughs> What'd you say? I said nothing to add. The boys have covered it. The boys have covered it. Yeah. And I'm going to sit here, and as usual, I'm going to say exactly what I think, which is, I think you're wrong. I think we've got to comply. We've got to, we've got to make our members feel safe. And if it gives them this, this weird perception of, 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 of safety by having at least their temperatures taken, I think it's kind of important. I don't think it's an invasion of privacy. They have the right to come back or not come back. It's the same way we take a health history form. They can choose not to do the health history form. And by the same token, we can just say to them, you know, don't come back to my facility. I would choose as a club owner to take the health history form, um, but it's scary to me. I'd put, I would put a caveat at the bottom of a health history form and say, you know, I agree that this health history form information that's being supplied is limited to this initial interview and these initial recommendations. And the staff will not be required to um, understand and use this information. Because when you do, like Bill said, when you do take information from individuals, if you got that information, you better use that information. Or that's when you're held to a higher standard. Well, now so, that you've called me wrong, <laughs> I'm going to tell you what I think. Uh, oh my God. Which is, I don't think you're wrong, but I don't agree. I think there's certain cases where it's going to make complete sense and other cases where it doesn't make as much sense. And I think you have to evaluate those based on your facility, your ability to execute, your members' um, impression of what they view as invasive or not. Um, there's clubs in, in the South, there's clubs in Texas. You're gonna have a revolt if you start mandating, you know, temperature checks on certain people. Um, so I don't think you're wrong, Sarah, because I don't know that I've ever seen you wrong. <laughs> but, I, but I don't know if you're right, and I don't necessarily agree there's one size fits all. No, I, and, and I will agree with that, Bill, because I do know I, I'm very, very surprised that going into, let's say, a lifetime fitness in Illinois, we've been open, we got, Illinois got open on Friday, no one was wearing masks except the staff. Staff was all wearing masks, but none of the members were wearing masks because it wasn't required by state law. And um, it's not required by lifetime. It's recommended, but it's not required. And you have this personal freedom, you know, without it, how are we ever going to come back? You know, we'll just be shut down forever until we get, you know, until we get the vaccine. Sarah, there's a great question in the chat, uh, which is, say, is saying, what is the liability for clubs if they let people work, work out with fevers or visible signs of illness? Uh, I don't have the answer to that, but perhaps someone on the panel does. It depends if the state requires you to, um, to check them. determine that information. Right. Um, we went to dinner with friends of ours last night, and on the way into the restaurant, I was shocked. We were sitting outside, sitting outside. But before we were even allowed to sit outside, the hostess took our temperature. And um, I'd never had that done. And I was smiling. I was happy about it. Um, but you were drunk. <laughs> Shh. Um, it was one vodka tonic. All right. But. Um, is, all right, ask that question one more time because I want to make sure that I think. What is the liability? What is the liability for the clubs if they're letting people work out with fevers or visible signs of illness? If, if, 
you want me to take a shot at that? Yes, story? please. Because then uh, I can find you wrong, and then I'm in the right. This yeah, is and then um, and then I'll have my social media blown up with how <laughs> right you were, and how wrong I was. And, um, no, but um, I don't know. That, I don't know what the liability would be. I think that um, this is the wild, wild west. Every county's doing their own thing in the U.S., much less state, much less federal. So you know, if somebody's coughing, dry coughing heavily. I'm going to ask him to leave. I'm going to say, hey, you got a severe cough. You're freaking people out. You need to go home and take care of yourself. Um, but, but what's visible signs of illness? Um, there's at some point personal responsibility in the world. I need to wear a mask to protect other people. I need to wear a mask to protect myself. I need to um, stay home when I'm sick. If I have a fever, I know I have a fever. I feel flush and feel warm. If I go out with a fever, I'm being an idiot. You know, so, so, um, so this thing about the club's responsible for other people's health and making them do the right thing, I believe in that to some degree, but you get to a point where it becomes um, potentially overbearing. And so um, I don't know what the liability is. I think that varies. I think it's minimal because at some point people are responsible for their own actions. You know, if somebody comes into my grocery store and punches another customer, I didn't reasonably have a way to prevent that. I probably have no liability. You know, that person's responsible for their bad actions. So I would say the liability in my opinion, which I'm not a lawyer, I don't think it's, it's great. Um, I think there is some social responsibility here. You know, I, think there's, I think there's something interesting here because I know we're here to talk about COVID, but there are other things equally and if more, not more so are contagious, you know, and that, that brings up the great point. You know, we know that we get a cold from our family, from our friends, what have you, our flu, you know, whatever. And there was a, a reference earlier in the chat about someone saying, oh, my, you know, my husband actually likes to go to the gym and burn it off, you know, get pushed through the fever. We're up against people's belief systems. And so I just want to put that on the table because that's not going away. You can't live in a world of freedom of speech. But there are also... Uh, recommendations, mandates, laws, and things being pushed in at the same time. And so I just want to put also on the table the concept of freedom, because in some cases that freedom will be taken away. So we've all sat here and said, if the government says we must do it, we must do it. But how far does that go before we get a Texas response, or people say, actually, you're thinking for me now. You are taking my freedoms away. So I don't want to turn this into a philosophical debate, but I think the, the, these questions are going to keep coming back to that. The way that I think I'm looking after the community is different to the way that you and you and you, and therefore we're going to be in a very, very interesting situation in coming years. I just wanted to put that up as a topic because I'm just looking at the chat and it's very hard to, to monitor. And it's incredibly important. And before I just switch to you, Chris, what I wanted to say is, you know, I get it that people have the responsibilities over themselves, but in America, we live in a hugely litigious society and they will sue you. They will sue the club. Anyone can sue anyone and they will sue you so that you have to settle and pay them. So what I highly recommend is before you let anyone back in your facility, you have them re-sign an informed consent form and a waiver of liability that they assume the risk. It's called an informed consent form. You're informing them of the risk and they assume the responsibility because that assumption of responsibility, even though it makes all philosophical, emotional, psychological, and social sense, it's not our litigious society. So get that informed consent form and that waiver of liability. When we, when we post the recording, um, we've supplied one for people to use. We'll give it to you as a business idea, but you guys, they will sue you. So erring on the side of caution, I, Bill, I thought that was an exceptional idea for, for, you know, basically get them out of the club as quickly as you can. And Emma, you're absolutely right. It's like people have to make their decisions. So Chris, it's up to you <laughs> to finish well, this debate and, and share with us your brilliance. Well, I'll tell you something. Obviously, all of us being in the industry, we're checking on local clubs, exploring things, talking to gym members who are all going back. And I will tell you, you know, California mandated masks, indoor and outdoor, if you are going to be within six feet of people. Gyms have chosen to interpret that differently, right? So some are making them, you know, wear it to the door and then nothing inside. 
and it's just amazing. Uh, you know, ultimately it comes to your values, you know, your, your mission, vision, purpose of values as a club and what you believe in and what you feel is in the best interest of your members. Because uh, I was talking to a friend last night and I said, Hey, have you been back to the local club? And he said, yeah. And I go, how was it? He goes, wild, wild west. He's like, they put a couple of stickers on the floor. Everybody's sweating on everybody. Nobody cares. No masks, uh, no screening, no anything. Um, there are two other clubs that were like that. And then I see, you know, other clubs that are doing everything in their power to from temperature checks to doing all that stuff. So ultimately it's going to be your brand decision and, and, you know, long-term uh, I do think the first group of returning people would return to anything, right? They just want back in the gym. They're not worried about their safety. They're probably not worried about other people's safety. So they're going to go in and be the hardest to police. But then you've got probably the second group, which is the biggest group who are waiting to see a little bit. And if they see the good things that clubs are doing, like all the stuff filled with the signage and the protocols and, and the stuff you guys are talking about, then you're going to get that massive group back in. And I think that, in my opinion, that's the way to go. So I, I can kind of what Bill's point in the beginning, you know, kind of a seven out of 10 mentality where we're not mandating, forcing necessarily everything, but definitely erring on the side of caution. And I do think one thing that's important to do too, as well is once you decide what you're going to implement and what's going to be used, you got to empower and train your staff to deal with it because I guarantee you your staff's anxious about this too. They may have concerns about their own health or health of family members and that sort of thing and their own safety. But then now they're concerned going, Oh my gosh, there's 10 new rules that members aren't used to that the first group of gym rats coming back don't care about. And it's going to be my responsibility to deal with this. So you need to really set up very strong, positive, interactive training sessions. So your staff feels comfortable it, with those areas and especially in product knowledge and policy knowledge and let them know, Hey, you need to enforce this stuff. If we decide this is a rule, you have to enforce it. So really empowering your team to, to deal with these sessions and giving them the training and tools to do so, I think is going to be hugely important. I think that that's, that's fantastic. And setting the rules, um, it's going to change. You know, those rules that kind of we decided on last week, are very different for, for Texas or Florida or California this week. And we, before we started this webinar, we were talking about that, what, they closed the bars in LA, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, you know, Chris, how are we gonna deal with, are we going forward, are we going backwards? And how do we handle this, this delicate balance where we know what happens with balance? It's, it's not static. It's constantly dynamic going back and forth. How do we do that? How do we handle it with our staff? Well, I mean, you just got to over communicate, right? You got to build that trust with your staff and again, empower them, give them the tools, training. Um, I think responding to their questions quickly, even if the answer is, I don't know, because in uncertain times, the last thing you want to do is leave people hanging, but just clarity, transparency, um, you know, and saying, you know, I have, uh, actually one of Bill and my happy hour friends from Thursday is in New York. And right before our most recent one, he, he texts me, he's like, Oh man, they just pulled gyms out of phase four. We don't know when we're going to open, but he then emailed his staff and said, they just pulled gyms out of phase four. We don't know when we're going to open. I'll continually update you. So it's that frequent transparent, you know, communication just to maintain those levels of trust and keeping them informed. And then again, empowering them. And like I said, decide the rules, let them know what they are, tell them exactly how to deal with it, lead by example, have their back, uh, and just, just stick to it. I, I think that's going to be key. Um, and Bill just did something that's really incredibly generous, and we'll also attach it to the recording. Um, he included, um, it's a reopening playbook, um, which is fantastic. It's a, it's a PDF. Um, and that's something that you can forward to your members and forward to your staff. It's directed towards staff, isn't it, Bill? Yeah, it's our staff reopening playbook. And then I also shared um, a sample new updated waiver that includes bacterial and infectious disease, as well as remote uh, virtual programming. Um, and uh, those are available and, and I'll share our member uh, intake form as well for anybody that might want it on the chat box. Oh, that's great. That's great. We got, we got asked by someone, um, we're, we're going to be opening our aquatic area. And how do we handle our aquatic area? And interestingly, and interestingly enough, I never, I have not seen anything directed towards that area. 
And we have an article that I just finished on Friday that we're going to be publishing it in our July issue of um, our SCW Spotlight newsletter, but I'll also attach it to this webinar. Um, opening your pool has all sorts of interesting challenges because do you walk through the locker room? You've got to have an entrance. You should have a separate exit. Do you have people wear shoes? Do they wear, you know, how do they wear their masks to the pool area? They should not wear them in the pool. If you've got a lane line, you only want one person per lane line. And for vertical aquatic exercise, it's not like I can put a sticker on a floor. You know, if you can keep them in lane lines and then you can document on, um, uh, by putting a towel or an orange cone six feet apart on the deck right by the edge so people understand and can estimate six feet apart. And then you try to have them exercise like routines for sardines. They should be doing their jumping jacks and their skiing and their knee lifts and all their pivoting in the aqua choreography in one place so that they're not moving so you know forward and backward side to side but it's again i i love the idea chris of what you said with the over communication because who knows and we're all learning from each other i mean i had to interview three or four different clubs that were opening and aquatic directors to figure out how to do this um now, Nancy talks about thoughts about students wearing masks in the pool. Um, never wear a mask in the pool because you can't breathe. The, the, the water gets on the mask and closes all the ventilation and you're not getting any oxygen. Please don't wear the mask in the pool unless it's someone you really don't like. All right, and then um, the CDC ruling it's somewhat unclear you should wear the mask to the pool, but not in the pool when you're working out. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Any of you guys, have you, you know, Emma, I saw you nodding. Do you have any special recommendations for going into the aquatic area? Yeah, I know that they've been opening up um, in parts of Europe, some of the spa. It sort of came as a later phase with the clubs opening up and they have not been, all the staff have been wearing it in and around. Um, but the members have not been required. And I just saw that Amy asked the same question, are instructors required to wear the, uh, the masks? I also saw at Midtown, they did a big uh, social shout out the other day. They were all wearing masks. Um, I think everyone was, even when they were exercising. So again, I didn't see them in the pool, Sarah, but it would be interesting to see what they're doing because they tend to have taken a higher standard along with Equinox as well. I think that they had their instructors wearing it on the deck. Right. Um, but that gets a little wonky because you're in a humid environment. It's very warm. So what they've been recommending is the pool tends to be about 80, between 82 and 84 degrees for a vertical aquatic exercise. It's about 78 degrees if you're doing just pure swimming in the pool. But the air temperature is, is high as well. And there's typically not a lot of circulation and ventilation in the, in the pool. So they've tried to open up a window or open up a door, but then you're turning off that emergency exit. So you're getting into a very delicate area where they've posted the lifeguards and had the lifeguard, two lifeguards, one watching the exit where the door is open and also one lifeguard, of course, acting as a lifeguard. But the air temperature, they've turned down slightly um, and tried to increase the air, the air circulation. I thought that was a pretty interesting question. I also like their name, Here, There, Everywhere. That was their Zoom name, which Love is it. kind of interesting. Um, what else do you see for systems for smooth and simple responses? Like, if the member has, if some member says, I was exposed and they call you, um, do you have a responsibility to email, to text all the members that came in at that time? The messaging, you know, typically people are required to make reservations and they're requiring people to make reservations in steam rooms and hot tubs um, and saunas, especially saunas. And there's only one person at a time, but it's that 
going in and out of the facility, we've got to monitor who is going in and out of facility, keep those records. Do we or don't we, Bill? You know, it, well, I, I, you know, all my steam rooms and saunas are closed uh, because if you're going to, you've got to completely air them out in between every one person and uh, the droplets hang in the air. And so all of my saunas and steam rooms are closed. Um, I had a, I had two members come in together um, at one of my clubs last week um, and they were not wearing a mask and they said they had an underlying medical condition that prevented them from wearing a mask. So happened to be, um, you know, two couple, a couple from the same household. Um, so our response is, you know, you can bring in a medical note stating that you have this underlying condition and we can work with you on an accommodation. The accommodation will be a face shield because the shield, you can breathe easily. You can do cardio in a shield and the shields you get on Amazon that say face shield on the top, um, they don't even fog up when you're breathing heavy in them. So I'm a big fan of the shield being an accommodation where you need to make accommodations. Um, the shields work really well as far as in aquatic environments. I'm not saying that people in the pool, but, um, but you can breathe and you've got that barrier of protection. So I'm just a big believer in the shields. But, but our response was, I don't wanna know what your medical condition is, none of my business. Bring me in a note from your doctor that says you have a medical condition and cannot wear a mask in public. Um, and we'll work on an accommodation. So you know what that accommodation will be. It will be the requirement of you wearing a shield. Um, so, you know, if you're that, if you can't wear a mask and breathe comfortably, you know, um, then you might not be ready to go out in public yet, you know? Um, so, you know, handling it with, you, when, when somebody's not right, you never want them to feel wrong, right? So, so, um, so when somebody's not right, you never want them to feel wrong. So give them what, why you're doing what you're doing, the accommodation, and, and give them an option. You know, it's not, you just can't come in. It's, we'll be glad to let you in with a doctor's note and an accommodation. We'll let you wear a shield instead, which is much easier to breathe with, you know. Do you, do, do you require masks at your facility in the common areas? In the counties that we're open in California, which is Napa and Sonoma, um, the requirement or the recommendation, uh, the requirement, if possible, is that you wear a mask out in public. Um, and so we have, uh, we require them to wear it in, we're requiring them to wear it um, wherever they can't socially distance, where they can socially distance on cardio equipment we're being a little uh, more accommodating because I have a bigger fear of people passing out than I do of them catching COVID-19 when they're spatially distant. And I've got a lot of distance between, uh, between cardio. Um, so, uh, but again, it's, it's every county's different and, um, and we're already hearing things on social media. Somebody was on the treadmill without their mask on, you know, um, and so, you know, people are going to have their own perceptions about what's right and what's wrong. And, 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 uh, and so we're trying to do, you know, what would a reasonable person and business do to protect everyone, their staff and their employees. Um, but every county is different with regard to the rules. So you got to know the rules. Chris Stevenson said that early on, you know, if the rules say temperature for all employees, all members, by gosh, take temperatures of everybody and, and do it right. And I like what you're saying also about standard of care. It's reasonableness. And that's the standard of care that the courts hold us to, is being reason, a reasonable standard of care of a similarly situated business. Now, I can't compare a business in California to one in Tennessee, one in Vermont, okay? It, you, it, it's county, it's seasonal, it's, you know, unfortunately in this um, uh, pandemic, it's almost hourly. Um, Chris, what are your thoughts on that? On being able, you know, how do we accommodate these things? I love the information on shields, closing the spas, the steam rooms, the saunas. Do we take reservations for our cardio equipment, reservations for the weights, reservations for, oh my God, everything? Yeah, well, you got to be a little bit fluid, like you said, because things change so rapidly. And then you got to stick to your brand principles and, and then make your decisions. But 
you know, we've seen everything. We had a friend share with us that a major chain uh, at happy hour last Thursday, uh, that a major chain was reopening. So that's a very value. I think that might be the most valuable webinar is our virtual happy hour every week besides yours, of course. Uh, but he was talking about like uh, this major chain would open for an hour. You had to make a reservation. Then they would close for half an hour to do massive uh, disinfecting and cleaning. Then they'd open another hour where you could make your reservation. Um, so we'll have to see what's, you know, working the best. Uh, we had a, uh, friends that have a club in Wisconsin who started with reservations and realized very quickly that they were okay without reservations because they weren't being overwhelmed with people coming in. So I think you guys, you know, you, you look at what other people are doing, see what the best practices are, figure out what seems to be working, implement it, but then be ready to change if that system's not working and change quickly before you uh, upset, you know, too many people. Um, and, and we have a comment from Nancy who said our instructors are, well, bad choice of words, Nancy, but our instructors are dying when wearing <laughs> face masks on the deck. And I think she's talking about aquatic exercise, but the CDC says we need to do it. Now, interestingly enough, I don't believe they say you need to do it. I think you need to wear the mask in the common area and keep the social distance. The American College of Sports Medicine uh, published that they recommend that everyone has 40 square feet per person between 40 and 60 square feet per person. If you think about it, that's six feet by 10 feet or you know, uh, six feet by six feet, which is about 36 square feet, you know, 40 square feet per, per person. So it's, um, which makes common sense, but then you have to really watch if people are moving side to side in front. And if someone is on the deck teaching and not in the water, and they're on the deck teaching, they are even further than that six feet away. So is it safe for them to take the mask off? I really am gonna go with Bill's recommendation of that shield. I think that's, I know the shields work because it sounds kind of ridiculous, but I'm a skier and you don't get your mask does not fog up because they've got the new chemicals and the new plastics that they use and they're using them with the shields. I don't know how much, does anybody know how much they cost the shields? Less than $5 each. Less than $5 each. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, when I went to see my dentist, I unfortunately chipped a tooth. That was really fun, but it was great. I was, you know, like looking like a hillbilly, but nobody could see me. It's fabulous. So he was wearing a mask and he was wearing a shield. So I'm not quite sure what if a combination is required or if the shield is, you know, a, you know, enough. Who knows, frankly, what is enough. Um, Sarah, just related to that, there's been some good posting in the chat around the sports specific. So Under Armour, it's on back order till August, but they're beginning to think about getting more oxygen in, whereas, you know, still protecting. So a lot of the sports brands are looking at this, not just the Kardashians are making uh, making shields and masks now. So it's going to become a fashion item and it's become, going to become functional. But like anything that requires tooling and design, uh, I expect there'll be some sort of backup. But that could be a longer term solution, especially if we're stuck with this for some time. Yeah, you know, SCW did a mask. We created... We made three different styles. One says strong as a mother, and then one says eat clean, train dirty, and then I think the other one says go for it, and it's like do it, whatever. And it's a double shield, and it's got a place where you fold over a coffee filter, and you can <laughs> flip in a coffee filter, and then you can take the coffee filter out, and you can wash the mask, whatever. <laughs> Sounds I, good. I like the sayings. That's that's kind of what I like. But um, I do. I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to this because this is you know. Do we email? Do we text? What's our messaging? Do we make a phone call if this happens to us? Because it's not so much. It's not our responsibility to totally prevent the spread of COVID. It's beyond our control. We listen to government regulations. If they say we're in phase three, we're in phase three. If we're in phase four. We're in phase four. Texas is Texas. Everybody in Texas has complied and whoops, you know, I don't know. Is there more testing? You know, did somehow a prison get infected? You know, I, I, I don't, 
I don't know. But if we comply with all these regulations, we've got to think of the impact on our marketing, our visibility as a company. Do we look like a safe environment? I got to get people back in my gym, man. I got to get them back. I'm dying financially. And, and we can say, you know, the, my forgiveness is up. Oh, today's the 28th. I get two more days of this forgiveness. And then I'm just hunting around for another loan to keep myself open. So what do we do? How do we respond? Do we email? Do we text? Do we call? I get it. Is it, is it just an email and everybody will share it? My recommendation is you got to stay on social media. And that's kind of a drain. That's such a drain because no matter what you say, somebody's going to criticize it. And there's silence. Oh, I didn't realize you were done. I'm totally done. <laughs> the question you got to ask yourself, Sarah, is what's right and what's wrong? And how would I like to be treated if I were your employee? How would I like to be treated if I were your member? All right. I'm not going to call members and email members because another member tested positive COVID-19. What I'm going to do is find out who that member came in contact with. If they had 15 minutes of prolonged exposure to my staff or another member, were they wearing a mask in the facility? And if I have members that have been exposed to that member, I'm going to have the health department contact that member and say, you come in contact with somebody that's tested positive and, and we'll let the health department do the tracing and so on. And we're going to thoroughly clean the club and close and so on and so on. Um, if I have a staff member exposed to another staff member because they were working the same shift, I'm going to make sure that my team knows about that so they can all, you know, self quarantine, be aware. Um, but, but, you know, when you're, when in doubt, Go with your integrity, right? What's the right thing to do for the person, you know? And so that's how we try to approach it. Um, you got to be careful about violating people's privacy, employees and staff. Um, right now, everybody's lenient about that, but, but privacy laws are very, very strict, you know? If you tell another member that I had COVID-19, and they go on social media and, and say things about me and it costs me a client or it costs me business or it hurts me financially some way, um, you know, that that's not good. So the privacy issues can't be ignored right now. You know, use your local health department, talk to your staff without sharing personal information of others, do the right thing. Emma, I saw you nodding. Oh, I agree. I mean, it's you just got to do with what you can right now. Um, my mind was just actually, I've just received, just to bring in another topic, um, we're all surveying everyone. And we've had, uh, you know, MXM and others talking about that before. I got a, an interesting survey from CES the other day, basically finding out the temperature check, excuse the pun, on people wanting to attend next year in January CES in Vegas. And it sort of has brought up all these things. Will you come? Would you come? Would you expect us to limit distancing? Would you be happy getting your temperature checked? Would you be happy giving a blood test? Would you be happy being tested every day? Would you come with a ready-made uh, presentation from your doctor or whatever, a health authority, saying that you're clear? And it's just got me thinking about our industry because there's a technological, and at the same time I'm juggling, so I'm spending a lot of time in the fit tech startup space at the moment, and there are tracking tools, and I speak to a lot of my friends in Australia. So uh, some places there, they're expected to download an app. If you don't have an app, you have to leave your name. So there is def definitely track and trace procedures in place, some through apps, some through health departments. So I'm just toggling the whole thing by other industries and what they are doing as well, uh, because it is the wild, wild west. And like you guys, I shop at three different supermarkets. At one, you wouldn't know that anything was going on. At the next one, you've got a distance on the way in, but then it's the wild, wild west. And on the last one, you're pretty much escorted around from six feet apart. So, but we're all the same people living in the same community. So some are really looking after themselves, some aren't, and some are in between. But again, it comes to that belief thing. So I'm just thinking, where will we go after this? Because this feels like a settling period. When I look to those places that are further ahead in the waves and of COVID than we are, I see that they are getting a little bit more organized about this and things do get sent out. So, so for example, you, you were booked for the nine to 10 slot within whatever club. 
there might be some communication that said, you know, from the health department or from an organisation that says um, you possibly were exposed during this time, here are the following steps. So I'm just throwing those things in my mind at the moment. Yeah. I'm, uh, Chris. Uh, it just what, What's interesting too is I think, you know, um, with social media, normally what we do is we put on there what we think are going to attract members. So it's the cool new workout or the great class or the dynamic stuff. Right now, people are looking for trust and they're looking for places they feel safe. So there's a great local brand around here that's doing a great job. And, you know, their Instagram story, every other thing is, look at me cleaning this. Look at me using the disinfectant. Look at the new things we put in. So I think that really is a differentiator, you know, like Emma said with the three grocery stores, given the fact that people are going to see everything from really well done to I'm terrified to go in there. You know, that's what I'd be doing with a lot of the social media right now is, and then making sure your staff doesn't make those silly mistakes. Uh, there's one club that we work with and, it, and they were trying to do the right thing. And the guy had a mask on, but he pulled it off his nose. And then he's like, look, hashtag I'm social distancing. I'm like, yeah. And you're also improperly wearing a mask or, you know, they'll, they'll say, you know, we're all wearing our masks and we do all this cleaning, but we all got our arms around each other. And so I think just being really aware that, that as, as you market through social media, that's what people want to see. Clean, cleanly, safe is one of the biggest differentiators right now. So that's what I put out there a lot. One other thing, and I've heard two or three cases of this uh, just kind of as a, a tangent, but with uh, talking about, do you report the cases? Do you communicate? You know, what do you do? And, you know, like Bill said, you definitely just follow the, the health department's guidelines. But definitely if somebody were to call you want to double check that that person is a member if they report something because there's been a couple of hoaxes where a disgruntled employee or a competitor is calling saying hey uh somebody caught COVID at your thing so definitely check and make sure that the data is accurate um before you go and say oh no there was you know there was COVID here no that person's not even a member so be aware that unfortunately even in times like this crappy things like that happen and it's interesting, I like, I really like the idea of notify the health department and let them deal with it. And you have to look at your client base. I mean, if you're dealing, if you have a, if you have a client base that's a lot of millennials, you know, I don't wanna say they don't care about the cleanliness, but it's not in the forefront of their mind. But if you've got an aging population as your membership base, you know, really highlighting the safety and the cleanliness and the and the the details of the regulations, that may make a difference. And I do like the idea of these of the survey, of figuring out what is most important to them. Check all that apply. You know, they'll probably check just about everything. Um, Sarah just got a text from somebody that said, "If you willingly know." that somebody is sick and you let them continue in your club, you could be held liable in certain states. So um, just wanna make sure I uh, add that to my previous response. Assume, and, assume that you're liable for anything that you do that's not right. <laughs> and everything you do that's right. That, that's what I learned from three years of law school. Thank you, <laughs> well done. Anybody can sue anybody for anything and they will. Just remember it, get your waivers, because at least if they sue you, you can shut them down quickly and save yourself the legal fees. Otherwise, you're gonna have to settle. And, and because fighting that lawsuit, even though you're, the, you're completely right, I did everything right, I complied with everything, the cost of that lawyer, and I'm married to one, trust me, <laughs> And, and uh, you know, the cost of that lawyer is going to far out, 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 out cost you um, the litigation because they won't be responsible for the cost of your legal fees. So get those informed consent forms. Um, and Bill, thank you for supplying that. I'm going to ask you guys, we're getting close to the end of the hour. I'm going to ask you guys for closing remarks. I'm going to start with you, Bill. Um, I think we've covered a lot. I mean, watch your social media, um, have, have other accommodations when you have these conflicts with members and, and members giving you a hard time about what you're doing for the best interest of everybody's safety. Um, make sure you've got your reporting protocols down internally for staff and members and uh, just always try to do the right thing. Great. And um, Emma? Um, I would just say if we're watching other parts of the industry, just as much as we don't want to consider it, always have a scenario that if we get closed down again, 
because we are seeing that begin to happen around the world. So it's not the news that we want, but be as safe as we can, you know, follow the rules, be smart, take everyone on the journey and just be, be really aware if there's dissension in terms of how people are behaving, because that could be our undoing. And I really like your idea of the waivers, but just kind of be ready for everything. It's, it's kind of the new world, right? Yeah. And Chris? Uh, you know, to, to Bill's point too, on just do the right thing. Um, we all know the right thing. And, and in desperate times, we tend to want to make that exception or maybe let that person get away with it or not turn that member away because we're, we're so scared right now. But play the long game. You never regret taking the high road. Uh, make sure you're, you're staying to the integrity of your brand. You're doing right by people. That way, when this is all said and done, when the people who didn't are no longer here, you can still be around to serve people um, the way we do in our great industry. That's fantastic. Now, um, uh, Bill, Chris, and Emma are going to be on our live stream mania. And we am going to end with a video here for you guys. So here we go. Stream Mania, we have a health and fitness business summit. And yes, that was Chris Stevenson with a mustache. So on that <laughs> note, I will thank you all for joining us today on this Sunday and, and giving us your time. And I hope to see you guys on Tuesday, another webinar on Tuesday. Take care, everybody.